Once we started focusing on how the customer is going to win by using us, that was better for us. The customer needs to be the hero. You are listening to The Deal Breakdown with Derek Shebby, where we spotlight the best deals out there in B2B sales, from the open all the way to the close. Welcome to the B2B Deal Breakdown podcast, where we give you the play-by-play on some of the best deals out there. I'm Derek Shebby, and I'm excited to be meeting with Jason Scoggins. He's a vice president of sales in the manufacturing and services industry. Welcome, Jason. Hey, thanks for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Okay, so Jason, tell us a little bit about your background. How'd you get into B2B sales? How long you been in it? Things like that. Sure. So, um, you know, fresh out of high school and I, I went to work uh, in the industrial construction industry and I was going to college at night. Um, I had dreams of uh, being an English teacher, actually. And then I was going to try to get a master's degree in English professor. But uh, I got sucked into the trades. And um, so at a young age, I started working myself up into leadership. And that's kind of when I first got the, uh, you know, the taste of sales because um, we would be out there and we kind of were under the model that everyone in the company should be a salesperson regardless of if their title is specifically sales, outside sales, inside sales, and VP sales. And uh, so I started bouncing around locally, uh, worked for several different contractors, um, pretty much sticking with the niche of food and beverage. Um, I've done some uh, chemical plants, production, paints and polymers, pharmaceuticals and stuff like that, but predominantly food and beverage. Um, and I worked my way through leadership there. And uh, in 2013, uh, a colleague, friend of mine, long-term friend, I call him colleague, but really he's my friend. Uh, we started our first business. Uh, it was an industrial construction business. And uh, a few years later, we started another business, a graphic design business to kind of get out of the, the normal you know, spin of things. And then uh, even beyond that, his background was in optics. And so we started a, a rifle optics industry or a company. Sorry, shortly after that. Well, then in 2018, we sold all three of them uh, nice. to, to to larger companies. Um, and then after that, I uh, stayed on with the owner of the industrial construction company. Um, I was working as uh, chief operating officer actually for them. And uh, when I resigned from them, I went to work for Magna Mechanical um, all along the way, basically selling, 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 especially during my entrepreneurial times. I mean, basically, uh, if you're an entrepreneur, that's all you're doing. I mean, you're selling, selling, selling everywhere you go. If it's uh, networking events, chamber events, whatever you're doing, I mean, you're selling everywhere you go by the way you look, the way you talk, the way you dress, you're selling. And so we tried to just keep that pretense going, like I mentioned early in my career, where everyone for the company should be a salesperson for the company, regardless of title. And uh, I think that's where you can really start to polish your skills. Yeah. Wow. The people, uh, the listeners have got quite a show coming then because, you know, you don't get too many uh, salespeople that, that started off in different areas of, of a business uh, and going into sales because the company had that policy and then eventually start going off on your own, starting three companies, selling all three of them, and then ultimately going back and, and being a VP of sales for uh, Magna Mechanical, like where you're at right now. So I, I bet you, uh, your, uh, your deal is going to have a lot of lessons for the listeners. So I'm excited for it. So let's get right into the questions. So the first question is, uh, what do you sell? What challenges does your offering solve and what industries do you serve? Well, we sell, we sell a service. We do maintenance and project and equipment installation. We also do fabrication. So then we manufacture equipment as well. Um, I've been in industrial construction for, Right at 20 years. Okay, great. So for that sort of thing, like when, when you're selling these, those services, uh, what challenges it, are you looking to solve with each of the, uh, the products and offerings? You know, it's, uh, what makes it hard is it's a super saturated market and lots of people get into contracting and not all contractors are quote unquote qualified but sometimes our clientele, they don't know that. And so it becomes a bidding war and that's when things start to get convoluted. And so you really have to sell your value as opposed to your price. And so that's probably the biggest hurdle that we experience there. So, so you go in there and you're helping uh, contractors sell more value. Is that what you mean? Well, as the contractor, we're trying to sell the, the production facility, uh, a more valuable service as opposed to uh, 
subpar craftsmanship, if that makes sense. Um, that makes sense. So I guess from the, from the, from the plant side, when would, when would one of them reach out to or look for, look for a company, a contractor like you to help them? Uh, typically production facilities. I mean, they're moving 24 seven, you know, they got to get product out. They got to get it to the stores. So what they do is it's almost like running a vehicle a million miles without changing the oil. So they have to schedule these oil changes in the, to- in the form of maintenance shutdowns or expansions. And so they'll say, Hey, uh, we have a two week plant shut down in July. We're going to need a contractor that can come in. This is what our scope is. This is what we're going to need help with. Or they'll say, hey, we signed a big contract, and so now we need to expand our capability, so we're going to be adding a bunch of equipment. This is when we're going to do that. And so that's where they would try to track down someone like us. And you'd come in and help make sure it runs smoothly and, and start to finish it all gets taken care of. Yeah, I, I kind of use a comparison. It's like, you remember the game Mousetrap when we were kids? You put yeah. everything together. It's like the big kid version of the game Mousetrap. You put all <laughs> this stuff together and then it works, you know? So it uh, it may come in as raw product and then it gets processed and then it gets packaged and then it gets boxed and then it gets stacked on pallets and then it gets loaded in the truck and shipped to wherever it goes. Got it. So, you, so do you have a team of people that you'd bring in to help we with do. all that? Yes, we do. Yep, we do. And we have... Uh, we also have a, like a, we do like a vendor qualification for other contractors say that like, for instance, we don't do masonry uh, internally or concrete internally. So we would sub that portion out to a, a qualified subcontractor through our VQF process. Oh, got it. So, so these plants are, they're obviously looking to move fast and there's so many things like you mentioned earlier that they don't, they don't know how to do and they don't have time to figure it out. They just, they got to move. And so they bring you guys on there that have the people have the qualifications that can take all that headache off of them and, uh, and help them uh, basically move their, their company forward in however way they're looking at doing that. sounds like. Yeah, that's, that right? exactly, yeah that's exactly right. And, and sometimes, you know, they're seeking guidance. Um, you know, we're getting older now. And so you're getting uh, people fresh out of college, you know, 23, 24 years old, they're, they're process engineers and they have a budget, but the bulk of their career so far has been in college. So they're getting in there and they've been presented the scope of this project. So then they'll look to people like us to kind of, you know, guide them through that and say, Hey, look, you know, this is kind of what you're doing. And, uh, you know, so they can kind of lean on us a little bit to make sure that they get everything installed in the manner that it should be while they're still kind of gaining experience, you know? Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. Okay. Well, good. Thanks for sharing that information about your company. It sounds, sounds extremely valuable. And, uh, I, I, I see what you mean about it being manufacturing and services, you know, in that space. So, um, so no, my second question for you is uh, what size deal are we talking about? You know, um, in this specific instance, like in the, in the deal breakdown, what size of deal are we going to break down for you? Is it talk, talk to us about that. Yeah, so the one that I chose to go through on this is it's going to end up being about one month's budget for a calendar year. Uh, so nothing to shy away from as a, this is a pretty good little project. So. It's great. Getting one, have, having one month's budget in one deal is always a great deal, right? Yeah, we were excited. Uh, it was a, it was a definitely a win for us for sure. Yeah. I mean, the industry I came from, it was, uh, sometimes it took three or four machines, you know, from the Xerox side just to hit one budget. So of course you had to, you had to meet with a lot of clients to get that part, but one, one deal to hit your budget. That's a good deal. Okay. So how did you find this specific one? This, this account. So this account came in as an, as an inbound lead, actually. Um, there was a man that I had worked with in the past when I had worked for other contractors and we had kind of kept in touch over the years. And so he contacted me and said, Hey, you remember when we were working together ba- way back when and I said, yeah. And he said, well, I have a lead on a similar project. It's going to be in your area if you want to take a look at it. And I said, yeah, absolutely. Sure. So he gave me the information and uh, we just kind of started pursuing it from there. Nice. So it was for someone else that he knew? He was literally just passing a lead on to you? Yep. Yeah. That's great. It was, uh, yeah, it's just good networking. So with him, um, was he from this, What did you already help him in the past in the same industry? No, actually. Um, it was just kind of, you know, in our, in our industry, like there's, there's a lot of us in the trades and everything, but the network is still small. You kind of get sucked into this whirlwind and everybody talks to everyone. And it's, uh, the networking there is really good. Um, you hear about little snips and 
things about different things coming and you'll reach out to them. And then sometimes it's something, sometimes it's nothing. But uh, this time it was something. So it worked out really well. That's great. You know, it's also a testament to you about the importance of, of having a good reputation, you know, in that network too. So yeah. And that for those people listening, you never know the things that you do, the integrity that you're building, you know, with these deals and with these clients that you're meeting with right now, it could affect you down the road in ways you don't even realize now. So good stuff. All right. Now, um, so when you, so you had to reach out to this lead, how, how was that first? It was still kind of a, even though there's a connection, there's still a little bit of a prospecting element to that or a, or a cold call, or it was more of a warm call, I guess you'd say it that way. But tell us about how that first, that first uh, touch was. Well, we knew we were competing against some other people. Uh, we didn't know everyone we were competing against, but we did know one. And uh, this, this other contractor has been someone that we kind of bounced back and forth uh, competing with each other most of my career. So it's kind of like uh, yeah, great. You know, good, good competition. You know, we keep yeah. each other honest. Uh, so we knew we'd be competing against them. And uh, that was tough because they were really good. But we didn't know who the rest of our competition was. So we wanted to try to fill that out and see what we were up against. You know, if we were going up against a very large company, you know, say that maybe had more overhead than we had or something that we could do, you know, to, to really sharpen our pencil uh, when we got in there and started crunching numbers. And so we, we did our, our homework there. And then uh, we knew that we were going to have to make a really good, a really good sales, uh, sales pitch uh, to, you know, really capitalize on why. Uh, the client should choose us because this is how we're going to help them is based off of, you know, our, our experience and what we know. So that's where sure. we were really, we, we knew it wasn't going to be a numbers game. It was going to, there's going to be a lot more to it than just the price. So. Those are the, those are the best though. That's how you really grow as a salesperson when you have to do extra preparation, and know, know the competition you're up against. So was this, so to set up this meeting, this, this first, this first initial meeting that you had with the customer, did you just call this customer up and say, Hey, this person, this person referred me to you. And was there any sort of pitch that you had to do at that point to, to, to set that next piece up? No, not really. So the, the individual that turned us on to the lead, we stayed in pretty good contact with him and he was in good contact with the client. So then this is where it kind of started to get interesting to where, uh, the client wanted to do business with our contact. Oh, and so then we're like, Oh goodness. Okay. This is, this is going to put a wrench in the operation. And so then yeah. we're like, Oh, okay. So, you know, now they're keeping us on our toes and they're keeping us honest. We said, okay. So we came together with my contact and we said, okay, well then what we'll do is we'll use you as like a project manager, kind of as the liaison between us and the customer. And then we'll work with you and we'll, we'll work together. And he's on, it was almost uh, like he was the buffer. Uh, so, um, that worked out really well. And so that's what we did is, is he came to our facility. We, you know, we all met in the conference room. We went over everything. This is our plan of attack. You know, this is how we're going to pursue this. And, uh, and then he would communicate back to the customer. And so we didn't actually have a conversation with the actual representatives for the client until after we were awarded the project, which was very interesting. That is very interesting. Yeah. And so the, the power of networking. Um, I'm sure someone else uh, that's familiar with, with the industrial construction industry, they'll be like, oh, yeah, I've been in that situation because uh, it was definitely unique, but it wasn't that uncommon. Everyone was very receptive of it. Um, everyone was happy with the way that it went down. So, Wow. And I bet some of the other uh, competition probably didn't want, I mean, they didn't, they didn't have that level of connection to the customer. I mean, if, you're, if, you're connection, if your contact knew the customer that well, I mean, you already had that trust built. It seems like you already had an edge. You know, and it seems like also many times that this, this sort of thing would happen in the past. Somebody would want some sort of overriding consultant fee or he's playing everybody and trying to get a cut off the top or something. No, it, it wasn't like that at all. I, it was a, it was a, I mean, I, I don't know how you would describe it in military terms, but it was just a multi-pronged approach. And uh, we just went in there as we were all in a unified front and on the same team and and it, it, uh, it worked out for us. So it was, uh, it was definitely a fun one. It was one to learn from. So, wow. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting for sure. So then, um, so was there in terms of like the first appointment then, if we were to go to that piece, um, is that when you had him, you had your contact come in and then you did your needs analysis with them, with uh -huh. that person. And that's when you came up with your strategy to, 
to then win the business? Yeah. Um, so he came in and he said, you know, this is what we're looking at. This is what we've done. You remember when we looked at this similar project in the past, yada, yada, yada. And I was like, yeah, sure. And he said, okay, it's basically going to be like that. So let's come together and let's formulate a plan. You know, what we need to do is we need to capitalize on our experience and our experience working together in the past in order to, you know, gain their trust and let them know, hey, these guys here, they know what they're doing and it's going to be the best bang for your buck. So. Huh. So, so in this specific case, you know, based upon what your company does, what, what challenges were you, were you solving for this customer that was looking for your services? Like what were you, what were you fixing there? It was a very niche market and, or, or I guess the market for the equipment anyways, the equipment was very niche. And so not a lot of contractors, I would be willing to wager in the, in the United States, uh, have experience in installing this particular brand, particular models of equipment. Whereas we did, and uh, both of us actually, my contact and our company. And so that worked really well in our favor, whereas other people could come in and say, hey, yes, we want to quote this project. Well, they'd say, hey, do you guys have any experience with this brand of equipment? Hmm. Yada, yada, yada. And, and, you know, odds are they would say no. When we knew that we would be able to say, yes, yes, we've installed this type of equipment, this specific brand multiple times over the last, you know, 10 or 15 years. So this is not foreign to us. We know what we're doing here. And uh, so that worked out really well for us. It, yeah, absolutely. When you, when you have a competitive advantage like that, that's a huge win. Now, uh, when you first went to the customer with your contact, uh, did you have any, was there any sort of next step that you needed to close for before the proposal or was it just straight up with the proposal? No, they were really interested in us and what we knew. So we had to put together a complete presentation, you know, almost like a resume of our company in this specific niche, in this specific industry that would really, really home in on our, our, our quality specifications, you know, for what they were looking for. And so, you know, then we, we got into specifics, I mean, makes and models and projects and project value and how many of our current employees were active on those projects that, you know, that so we're not just saying, Hey, our leadership has experience in this project, but not our field technicians as well. So no, our field technicians also participated on this project. So we're coming at you from all levels. We all have familiarity with this specific industry. That's powerful. Um, now you said project value. What do you mean by that? And that's one of the things you just mentioned. You said, um, I think it was project value. Like you talked about the, the people, of course, the leadership, maybe, maybe that's what you meant by the leadership and then the, and the employees, the value that they provided is that they'd actually done it themselves too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. The, the, the value would be the experience the experience with, yeah. And I, I don't know how you would quantify that data, right. And a numerical value, but I think it says a lot if you're uh, if you're the customer and you've spent, a fair amount on this equipment and, and when it gets put together you want it to get put together right you know if you buy if you uh buy a new house and they're building you a new house you want to make sure whoever's putting it together has done it before <laughs> yeah that's that would be pretty important yeah for sure um did you know how much uh you were going up against the competition like did you guys go in at a higher amount because of that i know that we weren't the lowest i was told that um Ethically, they don't usually tell us anything uh, very detailed. Uh, we knew that we weren't the lowest and we knew that we weren't the highest. So we were competitive. So that was good. Yeah. Um, so that worked out nicely. You know, we didn't have to, to lowball anyone to get in there. We were able, we were able to submit a, a fair proposal and also be competitive with our knowledge. So that was really nice. Yeah, I think, I think what it stands out to me with what you did with the proposals, you really knew what the customer was always obviously looking for. But then you also knew that you wanted to, um, you wanted to show your expertise, and that was like your big, your big, you know, uh, your big statement of building value in that proposal by showing the employees and the leadership and the experience you guys had doing exactly that. And you could put a lot of teeth to it. You could say, you know, you're literally gambling your your install with anybody else if they've never done this before. This is a very niche technical product that's being installed. So I, I like that. It's great. Now, how long um, after your proposal? Because w w was your presentation also your proposal? Did you want no. to? No. 
Okay. No, it would have been separate. So we we did our presentation and everything, and uh, the, the the customer was receptive of that. And so then now we had to come back and create our proposal. We had to create a whole job, uh, you know, our inclusions, exclusions per the scope, and and what this is going to look like, and if uh, you know the customer's schedule, um, if they say it's going to take eight weeks. And we bid it for eight weeks, but then because of unforeseen delays on there and it takes 12 weeks, well, then we need to have some sort of an addendum and, you know, and things like that. So we had to go back to the drawing board and, and iron out all the kinks and anything that could possibly go wrong. Uh, delayed shipment on equipment uh, got held up in customs, you know, whatever the issue would be, we had to iron all that out and then submit the proposal. And uh, usually uh, with our proposals, we have more exclusions than inclusions, but uh, <laughs> so that usually gets their attention. But uh they were they were good with our proposal and we passed it back and forth and changed things and adjusted things once more information came to light and then uh they went into to their review after that so then how long would you say after you presented your final version of your proposal after it went back and forth a few times um how long would you say it took before they actually moved forward I'd say they, a couple of weeks a couple of weeks um the deal from start to finish from from first getting uh, information about the project to being issued the project was probably about six to eight weeks. I can't recall exactly, but it was, it was fairly tedious and time consuming once we got all our ducks in a row. So almost, almost, uh, two months Yeah. to get, to put all that together. Okay. Um, and then, uh, so I said, so two weeks after you did your final version to get, to get the deal. Yep. If I remember correctly, it was somewhere in that window. I mean, it, was, it definitely wasn't a month. I mean, it could have been three weeks, but I would say two weeks. Yeah. Did you have to do anything to create urgency? No. Um, the only urgency we typically create is manpower allocation. So we have field technicians and, and our field technicians are, are scheduled. And so we would say, you know, hey, uh, when we get into this month, our field crew is going to be tied up for X amount of time. So if we're going to move this forward, we, we propose that we do it in this time frame because that's when these individuals that we're marketing to you or our experts are going to be available. Otherwise, we're going to have to push it back to this time. And so then they don't want to do that because with production, they're going to spend way more on lost production than they're going to spend on the contract. Yeah. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you're talking about humans and getting them there at a certain time, I mean, people have got stuff going on and it's a natural urgency to create. Um, but what about like their product itself? I mean, is it, was it just, they just hit, they just told someone, okay, ship it over and that second it would be over. Or was it a quick shipment and was there a no. line alignment there? No, it had been ordered, you know, they had probably ordered it a year or so before, honestly. And, uh, wow. so that, so it came from overseas. Uh, everything came from overseas. Um, uh, so it was in route ready to be shipped whenever we had caught wind of it. However, sometimes things get caught, you know, in customs or they'll get sent back or, you know, you hear the, the stories about, Oh, they lost the sea container off the barge and, and you know, oh, yeah. And then they have to airmail it back over, or another one over. And so anything can go wrong. So um, they knew about this project and they had ordered the equipment well before anyone that I would have been competing against knew about. I mean, I think they kind of keep everything quiet until they're ready to release it to the, to the contractors. That's to good. Them. That's good. So they basically, they were waiting to decide, you know, which contractor they would go with before they said ship it over, basically. Yeah, I would say so. Well, that's good. They're excited about that. So they already have that sense of urgency there, but you know, the human capital element, I'm sure you guys have that, have that talk track worked in pretty well where you just say, Hey, look, you know, whatever you want it, we love, love the business, but we can't necessarily guarantee that we, our people will be ready. I mean, if you, if you give us some time, some lead time, you know, you know, to be able to schedule these people out as of right now, if they did the deal today, if you said you want to do the deal today, we probably could guarantee someone would be there in September around right. week two to three. But yeah. if you wait next week, we might be looking at December. We've got some big projects coming up. Yeah. Um, sometimes uh, customers view it kind of like a major league bullpen where you can just like bring the technicians in whenever you're yeah. ready. And uh, it doesn't work like that. You know, you got it. You almost have them in a rotation. Like, no, they, uh, yeah. they can't get it. They can't get in until this window and they're scheduled for this window, you know, and, and uh, then, you know, sometimes it gets, yeah, and you, you also know, say this is such a niche. This is such a niche product. 
we've got, you know, a select team of people that can do it. But I mean, they've got vacations lined up. They got kids' birthdays. They got these things. I mean, it's hard for us to align the thing. That's why we need, we need a little bit of lead time to be able to set that up for you. So I think that's great. You know, for you, you your business, your, uh, your product, you, you know, the service that you provide has a natural creating an urgency factor to it, you know, and um, that helps. So, uh, so I guess, I mean, from, from a separating, separating yourself from the competition, it sounds like you mentioned it already by it being uh, the fact that you, you, your team from bottom to top had expertise with that specific uh, product install. Was there anything else that you can say that separated yourself from the competition? Um, yeah. You know, like you said, to be redundant, the past experience with that specific equipment, um, some of our individuals had actually had training overseas at the facility that produces this equipment. So that was like a real sharp edge. Um, we had gone over there maybe a year prior and, uh, we actually disassembled some equipment that we shipped here to the States to then reassemble. Uh, so we were saying, Hey, not only, uh, can we install this stuff? We've actually been over there and uh, we've actually worked on stuff over there too. And so they're like, Oh really? You know? So that was a really good, a really good thing. And then uh, we just really, we just really, I think we came at them with really great confidence in our ability to handle the project, you know, saying, Hey, like we do this, this is right up our alley. You know, this is in our wheelhouse. This is not foreign to us. We can handle this. And I think they caught on to that. Yeah, it's fantastic. That's that makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and the other thing obviously was your contact. Your contact was a connection to the customer. They, they trusted him or whoever that, whoever that person was and they trusted you and they, it sounds like it was a great, uh, had tons of things to separate yourself from the competition. It's one that they were hurting in the end on. So looking back, what do you think the three things were that won the deal for you? Like the critical moments, the things that stand this, that stand this deal out in your mind of one of thousands that you've done in your career, what stood out? I would say, I mean, the main thing is just going to be, our team approach to, Hey, our team in its entirety can handle this from top to bottom. We do this. We have experience in this. This is what we do. I think that was the huge, huge thing. Um, cause like I said, it was super niche. And so it was going to be like a needle in a haystack for them to find someone unless they brought someone in from, you know, out of country basically to yeah. find someone, I mean, to find someone local. I mean, this project was in our hometown. Like we weren't coming from out of town, out of state or anything. So, and that, I mean, that saves money in itself being local. Um, but I would say uh, just the way that, the way that our contact approached it and the manner that he presented himself to as just being, you know, we did a really good job as presenting ourselves as the guide for the customer. Like, Hey, we can show you how to do this to the best of the, of the, our ability, you know, and, and, and to where you guys are insured that once we get this stuff going and you're ready to bring all the stuff online, you'll be good to go. You're not going to have to sit here for two more weeks or, or two more months working all the kinks out of this stuff to get it to work. It's going to work. We're going to get it in and it's going to get to work and you're going to be able to start seeing your ROI and your equipment because now you can start producing. Yeah, absolutely. And it sounds like also with, along, along those lines, sounds like this customer might even reach out to you for, for service on that product or something. And if something goes wrong, just with it, just yeah. the amount of expertise that you already built, it's like, you weren't just helping them in this instance by guiding them. Like you just mentioned, they're looking at you as saying, you're just, you're almost like an extension of the place they're buying it. That's local. Yeah. And I tell them too, you know, like, Hey, uh, even if you guys, if, if, if you don't want to use us, uh, for your contractor, for any of this stuff, Hey, just call me and we can chat about it. If you've got questions about it, like I'll talk to you about it. Like you, I'm not going to charge you for that or whatever. I mean, I'm here to help you. And I think, uh, if you always keep helping the customer at the front of your mind and, and, and they can depend on you, then that builds good rapport. And then, you know, the, the projects and stuff will come later, you know? Absolutely. That's, that's, that's such a huge statement too. Sure. They, uh, they appreciate that. You know, I mean, uh, you have to treat your, your clients like you got to treat them like people. You can't treat them like numbers and you have to empathize and you have to say, Oh yeah. You know, actually I was working at another facility that had a similar problem. This is what we did to fix it. You know, you know, and, and they appreciate that. It goes a long way. 
Absolutely. And it, it also builds your integrity too, which is why in your network, you guys were contacted in the first place. It also, it sounds like the brand you're building, even with this customer in that network, is that you guys handle the most, the most niched, unique products. Like you guys handle everything. It's, it's, if there's one company you need to choose that can handle the craziest things, you know, it's, it's Jason's company. And so it sounds like you guys are building a great reputation. So looking back on a negative side though, uh, what would you say the three things that you would do differently next time would be? Um, I think that when we first got started, um, we, you know, this was going to be kind of, kind of hip, hypocritical because we, we took a lot of pride in our knowledge uh, of the equipment and of our ability to do the equipment. So we were almost demonstrating ourselves as like the hero contractor as opposed to being the contractor that's going to make the customer the hero by, you know, and I, I think that once we caught wind of that, like, Hey, you know, we, that's, that's not the proper approach. You know, you want to make your, you want to make your customer the hero. You don't want to be the hero. Sure. You can come in and help them get the winning, you know, the winning home run or the, or the, the touchdown pass, but the customer needs to be the hero. And so right. once we started focusing on how the customer is going to win by using us, uh, that was better for us. But I would say that was one thing. That's so, that's so important. And it's tough sometimes in sales. We get so excited about our products or what our offerings that we're selling that we, that we think that almost sometimes the customer is lucky to have us and to have what we have to offer. And I think it does come with experience of just, of just knowing that it, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter about what we have. It matters. Can we actually help the customer and be a resource for them and help them get to wherever they're trying to go. And I think that's a, that's an, it's interesting how you guys made that switch, you know, think of that way in the beginning. And then at the end of it, obviously by the time you were interacting with the customer, it was all about them and how you can help, you know, be that guide for them. So great, great ad. Yeah. And also, you know, I, I didn't like the way that we almost had a buffer in the initial communication through our contact. I would have rather us had, you know, face-to-face -face contact or meetings with the customer, you know, prior to us getting the ball moving, you know, just to kind of start to cultivate the relationship from the start um, as opposed to talking through an individual. Cause sometimes that can become like a game of telephone. You know, you tell one person one thing and by the time it gets three or four more yeah. people, it's not even what you said. Um, you know, nowadays I always, I always want to talk to the person. I don't want to go through anyone. I'm like, Hey, let's, let me come talk to you. I want to come talk to you, you know, because it's always better in person. And I wish we would have done that for sure. Um, even looking back on that, you would have done, you, you would have wanted to do that instead of the way it went. Yeah, I think so. Um, and even if it would have changed the outcome of, of us winning or not on, on the project, getting the, being awarded the project, uh, I would have still rather have done it that way just because I feel like that's the way that, that it should be done. You know, I mean, these are, these are your clients and these are your customers and they're people. They're not uh, an email signature or a voicemail, you know, they're people and you go talk to them. Hey, show me where this is going to go. Tell me what you're thinking about this. You know, tell me how you like, what do you see? Tell me your vision for this stuff. You know, let's talk about it. And uh, yeah. I think that goes a long way because you can start to get, you know, a little personal and you can kind of see what, what they want, you know, as opposed to just like, Oh, here's your project scope. And this is what we're going to do. Yeah, absolutely. And the fact that you guys still, the way you still handled it with that buffer, with your contact, I mean, it's, it doesn't, that's not something that happens that often. You know, I mean, it's, it's very unusual, but it seems like you guys handled it with class and maybe it was that buffer that caused you to go to that meeting being even showing even more that you guys were the guide more than your contact in a sense, you guys have the expertise and maybe use that to overwhelmingly show that we're there to help. So right. yeah. maybe it helped that, exponentially increase it. That's a really good point. That's a really good way to look at it. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. Any other things to look back on? Um, no, not right off the top of my head. Very, very interesting deal. You know, you know, overall about, about how, um, just how it came to you and how you approach to win. And especially in something like the services industry, which I'm sure there's a lot of B2B salespeople out there that, that sell offerings that they think, how can we differentiate ourselves and how can we, how can we do that? And you guys thought you guys sat back and really thought about how you'd win and from everything to, I mean, you, you had to know the exact employees that you had and the experience they had of actually going to the facilities 
you know, uh, in, in the other country to do that. And someone had to remember all this human capital information, put it down in a, in a nice manner for the proposal and in a logical manner and build your strategy around that expertise. And I think just all that information built so much value, but um, uh, I, I think it's a, it's, it sounds like a fantastic deal. Any final words of wisdom or things to share with the audience to help bring them more value to their deals? Sure. I would say, you know, n- nothing is, is trivial. Any, any person you meet or, or anything, it, it, there's value there. Um, our contact on this particular project, I mean, he and I had worked together in the past and it had been several years that I hadn't even seen him or worked with him or talked to him. And then it's like, oh, you know, now this relationship that was cultivated this many years ago is now moving forward and propelling our company forward and propelling the customer's company forward all simultaneously. And, uh, and then just in terms of sales in general, I, I think if, if you always treat your clients like people and not numbers, I, I think that's going to be the key to success in any industry, regardless, uh, B2B sales, even B2C sales. I mean, you got to treat your, your, your clients like people, you know, and not just, you know, someone else that gets logged into your CRM. Yeah. It's, it's tough to do that for the, for the early, the, the rookie salespeople, because they are just a, a person, but I think the better you get in sales, the more you realize that, you know, it's just communication and, and we're talking to human, another human being and we want to build good relationships. We want to help. And we want to be seen as that guide like you guys had. Um, so this has been fantastic, uh, Jason. I really appreciate it. Um, if people wanted to reach out to you in the future to, to learn more about you and your company or even ask you questions about this and or even ask, for, ask you for your advice on certain situations that they might be in, what's the best way to do that? Uh, they can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, that's good. I'm pretty active on there these days. Uh, they can go to our website. It's magna, M-A-G-N-A, mechanical.net. That's going to pitch you a curveball because it's usually .com, but it's .net. Uh, My email is jscoggins, the letter J, scoggins, S-C-O-G-G-I-N-S, at magnamechanical.net. Awesome. Well, hey, uh, thanks so much, uh, Jason. I really appreciate you taking the time to help all the B2B salespeople out there. Uh, This has been absolutely fantastic, Jason. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. So that's it for today's session, everybody. Thank you so much, Jason, for helping out all of our fellow B2B salespeople out there, improve their sales skills. And for all our, all our listeners, if you'd like to today's highlights, the cliff notes and the summary, make sure to check it out on our website, uh, www.salesin21days.com. You'll find it on there. Uh, but everyone have a great sales week and we'll see you next time. Hey. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast, then you have to come check out our free Top Performer Academy course. Inside it, I'll give you 12 sales tips that only the best salespeople do on a daily basis. Tips ranging from cold calling to running effective appointments, handling objections, and creating urgency in your deals. You can get it 100% free at www.modernsalestraining.com slash free. That's modernsalestraining.com slash free. These 12 tips could be the difference between you having a good month or an incredible one. I hope to see you there.